Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. My guest today is Josh Carter. Josh, are you ready to be great today? Amazing. Let's do it. Josh Carter is a U.S. Navy vet, a serial entrepreneur, a speaker, a podcast host, and a mentor for early stage startups. Born in the San Francisco Bay Area, he spent time traveling the globe before settling, settling into a career in telecom. For over 15 years, he worked for companies like Pacific Bell, Google, and Trulio on a variety of large-scale products. Having started a number of companies, he has led teams working on products for companies like Disney, Papsalu, Ribbon, Taco Bell, and many more. He led Brightwork, a developer infrastructure company, into, top -tier, into a top-tier accelerator program called Techstars, helped secure some venture funding. Josh has also led a Techstars-affiliated nonprofit called Patriot Bootcamp. Today, Josh hosts veteran and music-focused podcasts, and continues to work with early startups. He also hosts a monthly meetup for founders in the area called Coffee with Co-Founders. When he's not found a local meetup events, you can find Josh with his family hiking or kayaking. Josh, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jason. Really appreciate it. Especially on a Saturday morning. Yeah, I have my coffee, man. We're, yeah. we're good. Yeah, you got to find time to have talks like this. Yeah. So Josh, first talk about your podcast. How many, how many podcasts are you doing? Yeah, I have two podcasts right now. First, I do the Veteran Founder Podcast. We're taking a break right now in between seasons, but I've been doing that for a little over two years. And the reason we started doing it is because, you know, whether it was through Patriot Bootcamp or Operation Code, I, I just recognized that there were a lot of founders out there who happened to have one extra thing on their resume and that service to our country. And so we started and had some, we've had some really remarkable conversations including you've had yourself on the on the podcast and um and it's been such a thrill to get to know the founders who are veterans and and so in some cases military spouse founders as well um who all have the same thing in common which is that that intrinsic thing in, inside of us as veterans um that make us amazing founders so that's the one podcast that i'm I love doing that one. The other is a music podcast. I've been doing that. We started that back in 2008. And um, we originally started it as the 510 radio. And the objective was to just talk to musicians and artists about where they felt the music industry was headed. And, and it just seemed to be like a really good jumping off point for this discussion of which nobody really has a good answer for of where, where are we headed in the music industry? And so we've had Henry Rollins, we've had George Clinton, Imagine Dragons, we just had Portugal the Man on the podcast. So we've had some really amazing people on as guests for the podcast. Um, we took a little bit of a hiatus. So the format originally used to be, we'd play some music, we'd, in, we'd do an interview, which was about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'd get back into music. And then when we weren't doing the, the podcast type of thing, we would just stream music all the time. And so it was on our own website, on our own player that we built and we hosted. It was not, it was before Spotify, before Apple Music. Um, and then when we relaunched it, we re relaunched it into this podcast format. So since late September of 2020, it's been between 35 minutes to an hour of talking to these different musicians and really letting them tell their story. And I would say what's comparable to that is we did an interview with um, this 90s hip -hop, hip hop band called The Far Side. And Uncle Amani, who's sort of the main founder of The Far Side, spent an hour and a half just talking about sort of like this behind the music of The Far Side. It was a fascinating interview, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so we kind of took that format and said, well, why don't we turn that into a podcast? And that's how we got to the, to doing the 510 podcast, which is on all the platforms now. I'm going to have to listen to Henry Rollins and George Clinton. I can't, I have to imagine those are like some just out off the wall, great conversations with two right there. I, I, I can see it right now. Like, yeah, yeah. Henry is like on another level and I was really intimidated talking to him because I, you know, I, I'd heard so much about how. He'll make you feel stupid. If he finds a little inkling of you being stupid, man, he's just going to you know, pounce on it. And we had a great conversation. There was some times where it was, uh, it got tense, but that's just his personality. 
And then the next day he played in San Francisco and I went on his tour bus and it was the first time we got to, cause the interview was phone call, but it was the first time we got to like meet each other. And, uh, and it was just, it was just a lot of fun to, to talk to that guy, George Clinton, same thing. He was really nice. It was after he had finished a three hour set in Oakland, right before his 70th birthday. That guy's got s- stamina. I, there's no way I can keep up with that guy. Three hour class at 70 years old. That, that is quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great guy. So how often do you push out the music podcast when, you, when you're doing it? Yeah, we've been doing them every Thursday. So we release them Thursday morning. So every Thursday morning we, we release a new podcast. It depends on, on the availability of the artist, but I try to do them weekly. Um, and I think we've, we're up to episode 20, I think on that podcast, on that iteration of the podcast. But I mean, we've had, we've had some pretty cool, we had a, a buddy of mine, his name's Marco Collins. He's up there in Seattle. He's the gentleman that is basically responsible for grunge. He's the reason that anybody knows about Beck, poor, uh, President of the United States, Garbage. He gave them their first break. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's been a good friend of mine for a long time, and it was just so much fun to have him on the show. We took over an hour in that conversation um, just because, you know, it was just such, it was a lot of fun to just hear his story and how far he's come. There's a really cool documentary about his life called The Glamour and the Squalor. Um, that kind of tracks his struggle with abuse, drug abuse, um, and uh, and it's just he's just a really cool guy to talk to. So, just I'm assuming he has some kind of podcasting team to help you out with all this, with everything else you got going on. The veteran one, yes, I have a producer. She books everything, and uh, and all I really have to do for that one is show up. But for for the five ten, it's just me. I, I just I go out and I find the publicist of whatever artist I want to connect with. And I email them and then we just try to find time on, on the show. So uh, that was just me. So Jeff, why did you start these podcasts? What's the reason behind them doing this? There are amazing stories that I feel aren't being told in a way that people can really connect with these, you know, whether they're founders or, um, or musicians. I think we're all connected in some way. And these stories that uh, that bind us all are really intriguing. And so when I started the veteran one, I knew that I, I know what binds all of us veterans and what makes a veteran founder really remarkable. And so telling those stories is important to me because I want people to understand that these founders grind it out just like every other founder. The difference is they refuse to give up. And it's just their mentality and the way they're built and the way they, they've gone through things. Um, and so I, I really wanted to um, showcase them because at the end of the day, the hard part about being a veteran founder or being a military spouse founder is there are, is not a whole lot in the way of venture capital available to them. So boy, wouldn't it be cool if a VC could go through and hear the story while they're doing their due diligence on a veteran founder and they just so happen to come through my podcast and hear the stories of these amazing people. Um, so that's, that's one reason I do that because I just feel like there are just amazing stories that need to be told. The musician one, the music one, like I said, there's nobody really talking about it from the perspective of where's the music industry headed. And I felt like that, that's a missing component of all the podcasts that are out there that are featuring musicians. Uh, because truth be told, nobody really knows where the music industry is headed. It's kind of this anomaly. You know, we've kind of gone backwards. People are buying records again. Uh, and, and so, you know, MP3s really changed the game for better or for worse. You know, people could say Napster really ruined the music industry, but it, it, uh, it showcased and exposed holes in the music industry. That is clear the music industry, even today, is still not catching up technology wise. They're still mechanical royalty, royalties. And they define mechanical royalties in such archaic terms. And they still haven't figured out how to really uh, unlock value for, for musicians in this digital age. Spotify has to be the worst because they're not paying musicians nearly as much as say uh, Apple Music. Um, and that's why a lot of people like going on Apple Music, but 
um, there's a discussion happening where is, is that really how the music industry is going to be for the foreseeable future? And, and unfortunately, because of COVID, musicians can't tour. And that was their biggest source of revenue. And so especially during COVID, musicians and artists are trying to figure out how to be more creative about how they connect with bands. And they're having to do things that they probably wouldn't have done a year ago because they'd be on the road. And so what we're seeing, just like every economic downturn or every crisis, we're seeing the invention of innovation in the space that we probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. And I think it's gonna lead to some really cool uh, progress in the music industry space. And so the, the 510 is really about how do we how do we have a conversation about? How do we, where's, what is it from the musician's perspective? Because we know what it is from the business people's perspective. Like they just want to squeeze revenue out of every thing that they possibly can. But it's different if you're a musician and the perspective's different. And that's an important story to tell. I mean, you always hear back in the old days where people would sell records, like a, you know, a record sell for 10, I'm making this up, of course. Record sell for $10, the artist would get maybe a one or two pennies, right? And yeah. it seems like the same thing hasn't changed yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, there there are lots of artists who have tens of thousands of streams on Spotify and they get a check for $100. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And and without the product, without the music, these platforms were, would, not have, would not exist. And then you turn around and you read about, you know, billion dollar exits or IPOs in the music industry Meanwhile, the musicians who are creating this product are the last to get any money. And so the conversation really stems around, is it worth signing to a record label? Is it worth putting your music up into these streaming platforms? Is it worth doing all of these things if it means they're going to get pennies? They have to live. They have to be able to um, survive. But... Um, but they can't because they're just having to like figure out how to do different things. I don't know if it's true or not, but I remember reading this time where Little Nas X purposely has his songs like two and a half minutes or shorter because like if you did a six minute song, it's one play. But if you did a two and a half minute song, it'll be two plays for two and a half and two and a half minutes, right? I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard he purposely does that to get so people repeat his songs and more plays or more money. I don't know if that's true or not. I remember reading that. Yeah, a lot of people do that. I remember I I uh, interviewed Charlie XCX, and she's uh, she's one of the pop you know uh, musicians, and um, she she famously said on my on my show that if I can't write a song in fifteen minutes, I don't want to release it. And I thought, boy, that's that's where we're at. That's where we're at. You if you can't write a song in fifteen minutes, you don't want to release it. Like that's just ear vomit in my opinion, like, why would you put something out that is just garbage? And it's got its place, right? I think people want to just, you know, I watch, my wife hates it, but I, I watch comedy uh, movies that are stupid. And I do that because I want to turn my brain off. Yeah. I just want to turn my brain off and laugh. And I, I feel like there's a place for that kind of music where people just want to turn off their brain, not think about it and just have fun. And so to your point, there are musicians now that are figuring out how can we you know, release music that one is going to maximize my profit, but is also going to be easy to release and easy to, to digest. I think the 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 um, unfortunate side effect to that is that we're becoming less and less attuned to what real music is, and our attention span is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. And so things like TikTok, where a musician has seven seconds to grab your attention, I mean. I, it's just going to keep leading to these things where, you know, people's attention span is just becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. How do you capture their attention when you have seven seconds? You know, and I, and I actually like Charlie XCX. I like her singer style. That's kind of interesting. She's do, is doing the 15 minute song thing. I think she's very talented, but like, what do you do? Like, do you stay true to your art and become a star artist or do you like do what the, the business model does to make money? You know, I think of yeah. you know, artists have to struggle with, I guess. Yeah, and I think there's still a market. Like I grew up in the 80s and 90s and some of my favorite albums are those albums that tell stories. Uh, people that listen to my podcast know I'm a huge Oingo Boingo fan. I grew up listening to Oingo Boingo. And for those that don't know, uh, Danny Elfman, who's famously worked with Tim Burton on a number of films, like 
uh, you know, Batman and Edward Scissorhands and a ton of, ton of Tim Burton films. Well, he's the lead singer for this like alternative ska band called Oingo Boingo. And a lot of the albums that he released, like Only a Lad, tell a story. And so Only a Lad, their album's about this kid from Toronto, about how he was this sort of outcast in, in the community. And I love albums that tell a story. And I think we've lost that. Some musicians are still doing that, but they're musicians that are definitely not being played consistently on, say, top 40 radio. So I know it's like every generation or every older generation out there, they'll say, my generation music was the best music ever. My kids' music <laughs> sucks, you know. I mean, every generation does that. Is that just something that always goes on all the time or does, you know, I don't know. I do remember that, um, I don't know if you watched South Park, that episode <laughs> where one of them got older and he turned like 11 years old and he realized all the yeah. music was shit, you know? Yeah. Is this just a generation thing? Yeah. Guess? Yeah, there's a great um, meme I, I saw on Instagram. It was ba it basically said, um, "Your kids will have will grow up having their own taste in music, but just remember, it's going to be shitty taste in music." <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I I I enjoy the music that my parents listen to. I still listen to things like Motown. I love Smokey Robinson. Um, I love Sam Cooke. There are artists out there that are sort of reinventing themselves based on that. Uh, that old style. So artists like Leon Bridges, uh, Harmar Superstar. There are a lot of artists that have that sort of old soul, Alabama Shakes. Um, yeah, it's just, there's a lot of really good artists out there. Vintage Trouble is another good one. Man, uh, Tyler Bryant, if you like old school ACDC, Tyler Bryant is this unknown young kid who's a guitarist that I have never seen a kid that can play the guitar like Tyler Bryant can. And he's this unknown entity. Last, um, uh, not last year, the year before, uh, he went on tour with ACDC and opened for them. And uh, this kid's going to be a star. If, if he can get back on the road and, and go out, he's going to be a star. So there, I think it depends on what side of the aisle and what you're paying attention to. There are artists out there that are really keeping that old school uh, soul alive uh, where music was just about you know, putting good music together. And and then like, you know, Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters are just a rock band. And they always put on, you know, put out good stuff and they stay true to what they, you know, they believe in. So Josh, like and like you said, you know, there's no more tours and concerts going on. What are artists doing to replace that that lack of money that they're, they're, and how they replace that? Do you like virtual events? Like what, how they do, I mean, that's a lot of money they're losing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The Most of them are trying to do whatever they can. A lot of them have, the ability to kind of sit back and wait for this to ride out. Uh, but for those that don't, they're trying to be creative. They're trying to, you know, uh, sell tickets to a virtual concert or be part of a bigger event. Um, a lot of them are taking unemployment, right? Because they can't tour right now. What's going to be interesting is the slew of albums that are going to be coming out this year because they couldn't release it last year or they didn't want to release it because the, the typical format is they release an album then they go out and they tour on that album. Uh, so a lot of a lot of artists are sitting on new music until they can get out and go tour. So I think we're going to see a flood of new music as soon as they can start hitting the road again. Yeah, there's a lady I follow on TikTok. She plays the guitar and she has like a Patreon set up on a TikTok where she does like a little 30 second thing on the guitar. She said, you know, follow me on Patreon. I'll, you know, do an hour concert for you and they don't make money, yeah. right? So, yeah. yeah. So they just have to be creative. Yeah. So back to the podcast, like I, I do my own podcast, been doing it for a couple of years. And in that time, I know 30 people who start a podcast and only two are still doing it, right? So two part question, what's your advice to someone who's thinking about doing a podcast and how do you recommend that you know they stay at it and don't quit, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people get into podcasts and, and expect that they're going to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of listeners <laughs> and that it's good. That's what, that's the <laughs> leverage piece. That's what is going to make it and that's what makes it worth continuing to, to do the podcast. So if you want to start a podcast, lower your expectations. If you get 15 people listening to your podcast per week, well, then those are 15 people that didn't hear your story before and be okay with it. It's okay. It takes time to grow. I mean, the 510 has been around since 2008. And then we relaunched again uh, last September and we've done 20 episodes. Collectively, we've had 10,000 people listen to that show. And we've had 
artists like The Score, which is this really big band that, that's out there right now. We had Portugal Demand. We had uh, Dave Ellison from Megadeth. Like, I mean, we've had big, it's not because we haven't had big artists, it's because we just, we're just this unknown thing. And so I'm fine with that. And the veteran podcast has been around for a couple of years. So it's just sustain your interest in the topic. If you get frustrated because your listeners, you're not getting the amount of listeners you want, or you're so focused on your listener numbers, then you're probably doing it for all the wrong reasons. If you're doing it because you just want a story to get out there, then do it for that. You know, you're not going to get rich on podcasts. There's very, very few that do. Um, just stay true to yourself. Sustain your excitement for it. Um, stay true to why you wanted to start it in the first place and be authentic about it. Um, don't try to push a square peg in a round hole. It's not going to work. And that's true for podcasts. You just got to don't force it. Just be authentic. It's funny. Um, I use the same introductory music for every podcast I've ever done. It's a band called Tipsy and the song is called Kadonk because it's all instrumental and it's kind of funky. And I insert some little blurbs in there in the intro that make it even more funky. And I've had sort of mixed reviews. It's like cilantro. People either love it or they hate it. And, but I refuse to change it because I love it. I think it's hilarious. And, uh, and so I have had artists say, this is amazing. I'm so glad that I get to be on your show because I've waited to be introduced after your intro and I've had um, I've had you know people even on my own team go it's too long Josh you got to shorten it up so I don't know I like it um, and I'm staying true to what I like and and it seems to work out so Josh let's fix our veteran entrepreneurs so you, you you've, you've you've dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs veterans not veterans for the years yeah from your point of view is being a veteran an advantage or disadvantage to be an entrepreneur I think it's an advantage uh, in in one way is that, uh, and it's a disadvantage too, and I'll, I'll talk about the disadvantage as well, but the advantage is that the entrepreneur who is a veteran versus the entrepreneur who's not a veteran, they understand when they read and then when they get into diver, uh, adversity and they're, they, they're faced with a substantial challenge, they won't panic about it. They'll be able to put it into context and understand what that challenge means, think thoughtfully about it, pragmatic about it, and make a decision that is uh, intelligent, not just emotional or knee-jerk. Whereas a lot of founders that I've seen that aren't veterans, they don't have that ability to sort of contextualize how big of a problem this really is. And it's the same for the workplace. When I got out of the Navy and I got into the workplace and I watched people run around with their head cut off because like the chicken with a head cut off because there's some grand problem. And I'm sitting here laughing because they're not dealing with life or death things. And so it's, it's a different mindset um, and it's a different way to operate. The other part is they don't mind pivoting quickly. If they're, if something's not working, they don't mind going, all right, well, that's not working. Let's try this. And they're resourceful. Right. And so with other founders, what I've seen is they'll just, they'll stick with a bad idea way too long. And founders that are veterans and military spouse, they understand if that's a bad idea, I need to move away from it. And, and they're very analytical and thoughtful about it. The disadvantage part of that is that they don't have as many external resources, meaning when they get out of the military, they don't have a, a wide network like most people because they've been overseas, they've not been cultivating a big network of people to pull from, to say, if I got a challenge here, or if I need to make this connection here, I can't just pull from my network to do that. That's why things like Bunker Labs, Patriot Bootcamp, Operation Code, that's why those things exist because it helps to make a network even bigger. And I think that's what, uh, if veterans are thinking about starting a business, that they need to lean on those resources because that's your tactical advantage, your ability to like use that network and make it your network and turn that disadvantage into an advantage. That's a great point. Cause when I was stationed at Fort Lewis, like maybe hours out of Seattle, I never went to Seattle network. Right? I, like, it was like a foreign nation to me. I, and I finally started going like, you're probably retired. But it's like, we're all in a bubble, right? All the resources and person, I don't know who has time, right? You're working pretty much 12 hour days. So you want me to go network in Seattle or spend time with the family? Of course the family's gonna want out, right? So it's, it's definitely a, a, um, 
thing you got to work through. And now we're talking about the um, the, the veteran, non-veteran, right? So I know, and this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine. You always hear these people say, you know, being an entrepreneur is hard. And I mean, it is hard, right? Don't get me wrong. I always push back, right? I'll say, well, is it difficult? Yes. It's not easy. Yes. But is it hard? I don't know. Like me personally, I've made way, way harder decisions than I'm doing now. How did I do way harder things, right? And I always kind of push back when people say it's hard, right? Like, is it really hard? Like, you know, there's a lot of things harder, right? You know, you know, seeing your dog die is harder, you know, I mean, sure. having someone die from cancer is harder, right? So I always tell people, if this is the hardest thing you've done in your life, you probably done had a pretty better life. You know, I, I'll, I'll disagree. I'll politely disagree with that. I think that being an entrepreneur is the hardest thing you're ever going to do, because especially if you have pushed all your chips in and you have gone all in on your startup and you really don't have a safety net to fall back on, this, that's a really difficult decision for a lot of people. And I know for, for me personally, uh, we, I didn't quit my day job. I was still at Twilio when we were doing bright work and I didn't quit my day job until we officially got into Techstars and that money hit our bank because I needed to have a backup. I needed to make sure that I could still pay my bills. But when we failed, uh, it was, it took a toll on me. And I wrote a really good, a, a pretty intensive blog about this, about the depression that I fell into as a result of not being able to make it work. And so when I was doing Patriot Bootcamp, um, Charlotte Creech, who was the CEO at the time, asked me to come to a talk about startup failure. And I thought, man, that, that's a great opportunity. And so we did, we did the talk, it was in Denver, and there were 50-ish people in the room, it was standing room only, it was in a small little classroom environment. And I told my story about my startup failure and how much it, it affected me emotionally and how much I just fell into deep depression about it. And what was remarkable about, remarkable about that is I had veterans, people that had seen combat. I'd never seen combat. I was in the Navy three years. The worst I saw was you know garbage in Karachi, Pakistan and some stuff in the Persian Gulf. But I didn't see like combat. I didn't watch my brothers in arms get shot and die in my arms or anything like that. But these people did. And they stood up and they said, look, if my startup were to fail, I don't know that I'd want to get up in the morning. And that's a profound statement. Like, can you imagine you go to Afghanistan and you're killing, you're killing people or you're watching people die right in front of you. You come home, you start a business, it's your dream business that you wanted to start for a long time and it fails. And that's the thing that triggers your, your desire to harm yourself. That's profound. That's a profound statement because it means that it wasn't the atrocities that they saw. It was letting somebody down. It was, it was this, the inner sense of failing. The mission went off. We failed because we lost some people, but my business didn't make it. And that's enough to harm myself. I think that's, that was a wake up call for myself specifically because I was still going through that mourning process of losing my company, this thing that I pushed all my chips in. And so I, it depends on your business, right? If you start a franchise, you know, like a carpet dry business and it doesn't make it and you're able to go find a job, well, maybe you're right. That might not be as big of a, a hit to you emotionally. But if you have something where you have employees that depend on you and it's a big idea and you've taken money from friends and family or you've taken money from a VC and it fails, boy, that that hits you in a way that uh, few things can. So Josh, um, let's talk about founder depression real fast. Yeah. I mean, there's a few articles out there, you know, but not many, right? How come there's so so much not being said about it? What do you think? Is this like people have too much pride to talk about it or just keeping it to themselves? It's like this hidden secret, you know? And like, yeah. you know, in, in the, in like in the VC world, you know, that's, I think the stat is only 1% of companies get VC money and most of them don't even make it right. But it's just a sexy hype thing. Get VC money, yep. raise millions of dollars, right? And it's like, it seems like the hype is their time, not me meeting the actual narrative though of everything that's going on. Yeah, there's two things you touched on there. The first I'll talk about, I, I believe we're not talking enough about founder depression or, or things that deal that the mental health of a founder uh, enough. I, I think it's getting better and I, I, um, I like people like Brad Feld from Techstars who really make this a, a focal point. He spends a lot of time talking about it, but we don't have enough people in that kind of 
upper echelon of founders like the uh, Elon Musk's of the world and the, you know, the, just those top tier founders that have raised a billion or made a billion uh, talking about the stress that it takes to be a founder at that level. And I think because we haven't had enough of those discussions that um, people aren't comfortable talking about it yet. I, I did it too when I was a founder. People used to talk to me all the time when I was in the, in the mix of it. And my response was always the same. Hey, Josh, how are you doing? Oh, living the dream, right? And it's because you want to put on that good face. You want to put on that there's, everything's amazing. What are you talking about? This is a, why aren't you a founder? You're working a day job? That's silly. Like, why would you do that? Uh, but it is one of those things where if you're in the thick of things and you're fundraising and you're talking to investors or you're taking VC money, you don't want to project that there's anything wrong, even though there is. And it's one of the reasons I started Coffee with Co-Founders in Portland, Oregon, was because there, the, the, the journey of being a founder is a lonely one. And I'm talking a CEO, right? Because you can't go and you can't complain to your co-founders. You can't complain to your employees. Your spouse is tired of hearing about it. And your family has no fucking clue what you're doing. So like there has to be a way for you to connect with people. And so I kind of jokingly say that coffee with co-founders is AA for founders over coffee, but it really is like, you kind of go up, you have your cup of coffee, you go, hi, I'm Josh, I'm an entrepreneur and people go, hi, Josh, right? It's really that kind of like, uh, it, it's just a, a thing that if you're not connecting with other people, then you have no outlet for the things that you're having to keep bottled in. The other point I wanted to make was you touched on something about how like we celebrate when people get funding. And I think um, that's true and I still do it, but people don't understand like once you take money from a VC, the real work begins, that's even harder because now you've put your destiny into somebody else's hands and they have a very strong opinion. We can talk about that, but I think, you know, celebrating, uh, you know, raising money is just something that's accepted, even though um, it's not required for you to run a business. It's not required for you to grow a business. I have seen a lot of really good businesses that bootstrap. And if I ever started a business again, I would never take VC money. And I'm saying this while I'm running a fund. So, uh, so I mean, you know, VC money is only needed when you need to accelerate the growth of your business. Every, other than that, focus on revenue. So I'm going to make a quick comparison. I'd like to see what you think. So if you're the army, say you're a commander of a unit of the army, and you're training to deploy for a year, about to deploy, and they always ask you like a day or two days before, are you found or depressed? Everyone says no, right? Because like, if you say you're depressed as a commander, it's a curricular, right? You, what are you doing, right? And, it's, right. And, it, and is it the same thing? Like I'm a founder, I'm fundraising, and I do an article while I'm fundraising, and I'm, I'm, I'm depressed, right? It's not like there'd be a, a killer like right there. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I've, I don't know that it would be a killer. I think a lot of VCs want to be there to make sure that they're helping you in every facet of your business. And that includes making sure they're helping you get through whatever speed bumps personally you're going through. Um, and so the thing I always tell founders is um, make sure you're, you're sharing with your investors everything. Be as transparent, be over, overly communicative because if they can't help you if they don't know what's going on. And so I don't think that disclosing that you are struggling with mental health is a red flag if you're connecting with the right VC. If, the, if, if a VC believes in what you're doing enough, that's not an obstacle for them. They're gonna be like, yeah, that, that's fine. It's not a big deal. Uh, let's figure out how to fix it, right? And so, um, so it's, it's, I don't think it's a deal breaker. So if, so if there's a VC out there, he, he's looking at two funds and the both pretty much, I mean, two founders, the first the same. And one of the founders says, Hey, you know, Mr. Investor, like I'm going through some personal stuff right now. I, I got to need a break. I, you know, I just think he's going to go with the other fund. I mean, I don't mean negative there, you know, but just like, he's going to take the, someone who can be all in. Yeah. I mean, it really, it depends on the business, depends on the founder, but yeah, I mean, if a founder can't sustain their, ability to focus on the business, and certainly that's a red flag. But if they're going through things um, that aren't detrimental to the business, right? We all go through depression, I believe it or not. Uh, I think everybody 
goes through some level of depression within their life. Um, and the ability to get through that, uh, I think is, um, you need a community to do that. And if an investor, if you're disclosing uh, that I struggle with depression at times, um, and it but it doesn't have any impact on my business, then I I think they're fine with it. At the end, I mean, look, putting my investor hat on, I mean, at the end of the day, revenue is king. So if they're growing a business at a steady clip, but a founder comes to me and says, "Hey, just so you know, I've I've dealt with mental health issues." Well, we have a discussion about what that means, what that looks like, and make sure that they have redundancy in their business, not only in their platform, but people as well, including the founders. So, Jeff, let's switch to Patriot Bootcamp. Before we do, uh, you mentioned Charlotte Creek. So, right now, I'm in the thing called Patriot Bootcamp Elite 8. It's a new accelerator they're doing. It's um, Patriot Bootcamp, sponsored by Google for Startups and powered by Founder Truck, right? And Charlotte's actually my mentor for these next eight weeks, eight weeks. So, I meet up with her once a week. So she's a great person. She's giving a lot of great yeah. advice. So Paper Bootcamp is a nonprofit. It's sponsored by TechStars, correctly. I think it was started by Taylor McLemore. Yeah, Patriot Bootcamp was started by Taylor McLemore. And the, the who's story not, goes who's, that- Who's not a veteran. Who is not a veteran, but he has, he comes from a background of being a veteran in the family. Yes. And, and so um, he went to uh, David Cohen and said, why are you guys not doing a TechStars program for veterans? And David went, We'll go out and do it and we'll support you. And so Techstars supported um, the program, but it was really just supposed to be a one-off program. And so they did the one, one-off one program. I think Charlotte was part of that program. And they went back to Taylor and said, you have to do this way more than once. Like this needs to be a recurring thing. And so, um, so that's what they did. They started to do it twice a year. Uh, I was an attendee in 2014 uh, in Wisconsin. And so my first exposure to uh, Patriot Bootcamp was, was in Mil um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or Madison, Wisconsin. And we did it at uh, University of Wisconsin and it was such a great event. I did what every, everybody does when they go through that event. They went, I've got to help you. How can I get this in my market, right? You got to bring this to Portland. And so, um, you know, I did what, what everybody does and tried to advocate to bring it to the West Coast. And so were you the CEO, CEO, I forgot, for a time? Well, I, yeah, so I joined as the chief operating officer. And then when Charlotte left, I was elevated to the CEO, but on an interim basis. So it was, let's see if this is the right fit. Let's see if this is gonna be a good fit for Josh. If not, we'll find another CEO. Um, but it, at the time I'd found another role that I, I felt was um, kept me here in Portland and helped uh, allowed me to help build up the Portland startup scene. So I ended up, I left uh, Patriot Bootcamp and Jen Pilcher, who is a remarkable CEO, uh, took over as, and who is now the CEO. And I went and ran uh, WeWork Labs in Portland. So what is it that Patriot Bootcamp does? Yeah, it takes that three month Techstars model and squishes it down to three days. So if you can imagine like, mentor madness and uh, educational uh, uh, components and panel discussion. And then it all culminates to some sort of demo day. That's exactly what Patriot Bootcamp does. It's sort of the format of it. We start with, you know, you connect with a bunch of mentors. We have this sort of like mentor speed dating thing that happens. Um, and then we put up panels about fundraising versus boot camp, uh, bootstrapping. We have, um, people that talk about how they grew their company. Dave Mandel always does how to rock your pitch. Um, you know, we have somebody like, um, I can't remember his name from MX, but he'll come up and tell his story. And so it's, it's really profound because it connects founders with a, a group of people that have already gone through that journey and can help them understand how to get from ideation to scale. So Josh, like tech stars focus on, you know, tech startups. Does Patriot Bootcamp do the same thing? Do they just only focus on tech startups? Or is it all kind of businesses, like all kind of levels? It's all kind of, I mean, when I was running it, we tried to focus, stay focused on tech startups because we knew that's who we could help. But I mean, we really invited anybody. I remember in the Denver Patriot Bootcamp, right before I joined, uh, I was a mentor 
And the woman sitting across from me was creating a garden as a service. And that was her business. She was going to go around and help start a garden for a family and then cultivate it and be there, sort of like be the Uber of gardens. Um, and that was just the idea she had bouncing around in her head. So, I mean, I, we've had all kinds of business that we had, um, uh, we had, we had a robot lawnmower company that got on Shark Tank. Uh, we've had a nut butter company, uh, you know, Aaron Barnes uh, brought nut, his nut butter company through there. So we've, we've had all kinds of food companies, tech companies, IOT, hardware, you name it, we've had it. So Josh, I mean, you, you've, you've seen a lot of stuff through the years for the different places you've been at. Is there a way you can tell someone's going to be successful, not successful? Is it like a like within a few minutes or how does that work for you? Yeah, that's a great question. It's hard to answer because I've I've stopped assuming what a good idea is. We went through Techstars in 2016 and we went through with a company that I thought was just, and I won't call them out because they're still in business. But I, I when I went in, I was like, there's no way we're going to be the, one of the top companies in this program. We were the first to shut down. So I stopped assuming what a good idea for a business is. And at the end of the day, I think there's a few components that make um, a business a good business. And it starts with the founding team and their ability and their tenacity to weather ups and downs. And um, so it, it could be a party business. It could be you know, a device business. It could be a collection, you know, collectibles business. It doesn't matter as long as the founders can sustain their excitement about it put the right team in place to help them grow, set the right expectations. Boy, I, I think that any business could be a growth business. I mean, go back to, if, if you go back in 2005 and you told people back then, hey, in 2020, we're going to be sleeping in random strangers' houses, have them come stay in our bedroom. <laughs> they're like, they're like, you're, 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 you're a lunatic. No one's going to do that, but here we are, right? Oh man, yeah. I mean, when I joined Twilio, uh, and I and I saw that I could write four lines of code and make a phone ring. It blew my mind because for the past 15 years, I'd been putting in these phone systems that were as big as refrigerators. And so it was just remarkable for me personally to go from crawling under houses and climbing up telephone poles to put up residential phone line to going to these hybrid systems that were sort of like half voice over IP and half landline and putting in things like T1 lines, which or DSL lines, which are just laughable now, um, to going to like, I can write code and a phone suddenly rings, or I can build a platform that does tenant partitioning so that I can route phones to different places. And all I have to do is write some code to do that. Like, that's insane to me, but that's what made Twilio so impactful and so remarkable is that people were already looking at things like Avaya and Cisco because they were the things that were driving business telecommunications. And suddenly here comes Jeff Lawson, who was the CTO at, uh, at Amazon and, or a product manager at Amazon. And suddenly he's like going to take on Avaya and Cisco. He was laughed out of so many rooms because they were just like, there's no way Twilio is going to be the future of what we do as communications. But now it's everything, like it's the Kleenex of communication. If you've ever taken an Uber or gotten a text from your Grubhub person, that's all Twilio on the back end driving all of that. And so they are a you know $51 billion business now. They bought SendGrid, they bought Authy, like they've, they're just gobbling up the world now. Yeah, I remember they bought SendGrid, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I joined when we were, I mean, we still fit in a kitchen. And we, every week we would have our staff meeting and we'd be thanking people in the room that helped us the week before. And, uh, and we had a big party at our headquarters because we reached 3 million in revenue one month. And, uh, and so we had a big party because we hit a huge milestone. And uh, looking back, I'm sure they're doing $3 million a minute at this point. But I mean, yeah, we had like a bouncy house. We had cotton candy machines. Like we just did the startup thing that all startups do. We hit a milestone. Let's have a big party. Um, and, but looking back on those days, like I still talk, we have a slack of former Twilio people and we still talk. I still talk to my, my former boss and, and we still lament about things that happened. In fact, something came up this week where we talked about a huge outage that occurred because one of the um, engineers had pushed an update and it changed everybody's account ID number. And that's how we mapped 
everything. Basically, we mapped their usage through that. We mapped their billing through that. And he pushed an update that changed everything. And Jeff actually got into the shell and ran a script to help update everything. Like he just went in and got his hands dirty. And so when you're asking like, what makes a good founder? It's a lot of that stuff. Like if your founder can go in and get their hands dirty and do the work uh, and not have to rely on anybody else to do the work, boy, that, that is a defensible uh, business in the biggest way possible. And that's one of the things that we didn't recognize at Brightwork. I'm not a coder. I mean, I can do some nominal stuff, but you don't want to work on anything I've built because it probably doesn't work right. And so I had to bring in what a lot of founders do. I had to bring in a technical co-founder. And when that technical co-founder left, I couldn't continue building the platform. So what happened? You know, we ran out of cash and we died. So, um, you know, those different components, the ability to get your hands dirty, the ability to make sure that the company doesn't fail because somebody that's coding the platform leaves, like all of those in the aggregate make a remarkable founder. So Josh, um, and I could be wrong about this, but can you talk about how it seems like the average American doesn't realize how, how advanced tech is right now? I think that's true. I think, you know, most people um, are happy just doing what they do and, and hope that somebody comes along and builds something that makes their lives easier. Um, that's why not very many people become entrepreneurs. Um, and I think there are a lot of really cool things that make our lives easier that people just don't understand. I mean, I'm, I'm that way too, to be honest, like we're, you know, doing a lot of new things to our house. We're modeling a lot of things and I have a lot of tech in our house, but like, I'll go to a friend's house and they're way more efficient at this tech stuff for their home than I am. And I'm like, Whoa, uh, why did I not hear about this? Why don't I know about this? And so I think part of it is just awareness. And I don't know how to make that better. Um, I think if it's a topic you're interested, you're probably going to know about it regardless of what it is. But in a lot of ways, there are just things that we don't know about. And, uh, and I think that's true for technology as well. Josh, next, talk about your time with Operation Code. You, you just left them recently too, right? I'm still a, officially a board member, but I stepped down from the board chair position. And that, this is my second stint. Um, I joined, uh, so first of all, Operation Code is a nonprofit created to help people in the military community, so veterans and military spouse. Um, take their skill set to the next level and find a new career in technology. Now, that's a different mission than when we started. And when I helped David Molina start Operation Code, um, we were focused on, specifically on code schools and specifically on the GI Bill not being able to be used for code schools. So when you got out of the military and you, you have your GI Bill, at the time, you couldn't say, go to a code school like Galvanize or Epicodus or Flatiron. You couldn't use that money to pay for your code school. And the reason is because those code schools aren't accredited. And they typically cannot get their accreditation because the curriculum changes so frequently as the technology changes. Um, and so David Molina noticed this and, and realized this is a big problem. And so Operation Code was created to solve that problem, to solve the problem of using the GI Bill for code schools. In 2016, Conrad Holloman, David Molina, and a few others flew out to DC to work with lawmakers to figure out how we can change that, how we can make that better. And so they worked with folks like Joe Kennedy and Tulsi Gabbard and others to, um, to help craft legislation that ended up creating vet tech. And so the legislation was signed in 2017 by President Trump, and that created what's called vet tech. Vet tech sort of sits in this middle between the code schools and the GI Bill. If the school can get their vet tech certification, then that's enough of a mechanism for, for people to use the GI Bill to go to those code schools. So when we got back, or when David and, and Conrad got back, um, it was really like, well, okay, mission accomplished. Now what? Like, what, what do we do now? Uh, and so I joined the board again. After I left Patriot Boot Camp, I joined the board uh, in January of 2019. And I sat down with the rest of the board and I said, well, let's figure out where we sit in the ecosystem, because that will help drive our decision about what 2.0 of Operation Code will look like. And so we really landed our plane on 
we sit in that intersection between when somebody gets out of code school or some sort of vocationary school, trade school, and when they want to get a job. And we've created this really good ecosystem partner, whatever you want to call it, where we connect with people that want to hire people in our community. And so we thought, what if we created things like apprenticeship programs so that if say Apple or Facebook or Google had five recs for product managers or UX UI or uh, you know, scrum masters or Python developers, we could take from our more than 8,000 people in our community now and find five people, put them through an apprenticeship program, teach them how to acclimate to a startup culture, which is way different than being in a military culture. And, and hopefully those five people then get jobs in these really cool tech companies. So that's what we do now. Like we just kind of fell into this, like this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna build these amazing programs. So we used to be this chapter model, similar to Bunker Labs where we'd have chapters all over the place. We'd have events and stuff. Uh, COVID obviously changed those plans. And, and who knows, maybe we get back to that after COVID goes away. But our focus today is how do we help people find really, really rewarding careers um, by you know, building these programs. And so through partnerships with folks like shift.org or you know, Veterati, we've been able to build a really cool community and infrastructure that supports people. And you know, we got to 8,000 people faster than we got to 7,000. We got to 7,000 faster than we got to 6,000. So we're growing rapidly. And so a lot of people, as they're losing their jobs, they're coming to places like Operation Code to get help because maybe they, before they were you know, working in a mill or working as a carpet cleaner or something. And they recognize that tech is a far more sustainable career option. So they're coming to us as a blank slate and we're helping craft them and build them and mold them into people that can have really long lasting rewarding careers in technology, whatever that means. And one thing I'm a fan too is the operation code Slack channel. Like you go on the Slack channel, you just see so many people helping each other, giving advice, mentoring, amidst like it's a strong community on, on your Slack channel. Yeah, and, and we've been very deliberate on what kind of community we want to build. We spent a lot of time last year trying to make sure that we uh, we kind of stay focused on our mission and then our community stays focused on our mission. So, you know, people, when they come to our Slack, there's only two reasons they come to the operation code Slack. They either want help or they want to help. There's no third option. Nobody comes to us and says, boy, let's go talk politics in operation code Slack. Like we've deliberately <laughs> written our code of conduct in a way that like kind of curbs that. And I'm proud to say, you know, like even through this very tumultuous uh, election cycle, we had virtually no discussions in our Slack related to politics because it's just a tremendous focus of our community. It doesn't matter what background you come from. It doesn't matter what political background you serve. You served in the military or you were part of a military family and that's what binds us all. And that's the common thing that helps. So that's, as long as people stay focused on that, it is one of the strongest veteran communities uh, in the country. And I'm I'm so proud of what we've been able to build. So Josh, and maybe this is just the current economy of what's going on, but like you see so many people now on LinkedIn or whatever the case would be, they're like have master's degree, bachelor's degrees, like marketing, sales, philosophy, something unrelated to coding. And then now they're going to coding academy and trying to be a developer. So like you're looking, okay, you have a master's in this, like what's going on here, right? But coding is like, there's, there's such a need for coding developers, right? I think, here's my thought. It doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, a doctor, or whatever. If you know how to code, you can make your job far more efficient. Uh, and I've seen this before. Like if you could do a nominal amount of scripting, you can make your job so much more easy. And so I think that's the mindset people need to get into is that imagine what you can do. Imagine what you could build to make your job easier if you knew how to code. There's a really famous quote that Jeff Lawson, he, he talks about it all the time, but it is, if there's a problem that can be brought into software, that problem can be solved. And that's true for no matter what field you're in. 
And so I think you're starting to see more and more people get interested in it, no matter what their background is, because they're starting to understand that if they bring to the table in their work environment, this skill set that nobody else has, well, then they're separating themselves from the other people within their workplace. And that's the same for people that want to change careers. They're seeing that this is a skill set that is only bound by our imagination. We're seeing things like I just talked to a, a startup the other day working on holographic tables. I mean, that's stuff from Star Wars and they're making it a reality. I mean, we're just seeing such a profound shift in the things that people are working on and people are recognizing that if they don't get on the bus and start figuring out how to get these skill sets, they're going to be left behind. Yeah, let's move on to your role at WeWork Labs in Portland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't think most people don't know what WeWork Labs is. Yeah, was. So WeWork Labs was um, a perpetual startup program at WeWork. And the reason WeWork started the program was that they recognized that they had something that not a lot of other companies had, which was a global network. There are WeWork locations on virtually every continent. And so imagine if you could put together a program for early stage companies and could pull resources from Singapore, Australia, Japan, Israel, the UK, uh, and the States, and Mexico, and South America, if you could pull those resources, you could really accelerate a lot of business, a lot of businesses. So I think aspirationally, they were in the right headspace to create this program. It was different in that if you were a company that wanted to join my program, you would come to the program, but it didn't have an end date. And so it allowed us to create programming that had a far less impact on your business. For example, Techstars is three months and you really don't have a whole lot of time to work on your business because you are just going and going and going. Mentor Madness, you have no control over your, your calendar. Techstars does. And they put six to eight people in front of you a day, which means if you want to work on your business, you're going to do it after hours because, you know, eight, eight o'clock to six o'clock, they're just shoving people in front of you. The WeWork Labs was different in that we weren't shoving people in front of you. We weren't putting programming in front of you that was just going to like keep you from being able to work on your business. So it allowed us to like be thoughtful and sit down with these founders and say, what are you struggling with? Let's make sure we're putting in place programming elements that help, uh, help you achieve your specific goals. And so it's far more strategic it was far more targeted and allowed us to really build better founders that way. And so we would still have weekly programming elements, things like you know, Wednesday night lunches or Friday, Friday lunches with founders, or we brought in other founders to talk about their journey, or you know, we, would, we would have a lot of really good um, uh, programming elements. I think where we went wrong with that overall was that we didn't have we, we couldn't figure out how to put money, put skin in the game for these companies. So the way they were able to get into the company or in the program was they had to pay a monthly fee uh, to pay for a desk to get into that program. And that was different than anything else that, that was out there. Uh, so it kind of changed the dynamic. It was almost like a customer uh, relationship, which kind of muddied the waters when it was like, if I'm a program manager, and I'm telling you, this is what you should do with your business. It left leverage for them to push back and say, well, no, I pay you a monthly fee. I want to do it this way. So the relationship was different than any other program I'd seen. Uh, but it also meant that we could really do some remarkable things that we did. I mean, from Seattle to San Jose, that was our territory. And we would go down to San Francisco and we would do monthly showcase events where we'd fill the room with like Bay Area investors and bring companies down from Portland and bring companies down from Seattle and put them in front of really key names in, in the investment, which was different than what they'd been exposed to, especially in our markets, because there aren't that kind of level of investor 
in Portland or Seattle, where it's like top tier Sand Hill Road style VCs. So it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed my job. Uh, I was in a, a historic building, which I found out last night is being closed, unfortunately. But I think um, there was just a lot of things with WeWork Labs that were outside of our control uh, that led to its demise. And um, it's unfortunate, but I, I thought we we were on to something pretty special. No, I was actually part of WeWork Labs here in Seattle a year ago. And for I was Elizabeth Scallon and then um, I can't remember the lady who took her place. They were bringing these great speakers in, like stand-ups, and no one would go. Like, we meet two other people, though, right? And yeah. I, and I understand, like you said, they're paying money, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, all that. Like, they're bringing these great speakers, like investors, and, like, no one will come at all. I mean, a few people yeah. did once in a while, but it's like, man, yeah. I definitely think it was a missed opportunity for a lot of people. And and that was the dynamic that was so hard to figure out because you can't make people come when – you know, they're paying for the desk. What are you going to kick them out of your program? Now, I will say I had in the past kicked out a couple of founders out of my program because for me, at least, and I'll just speak for me and my program in Portland, it was more important for me to create a community of founders who were willing to help each other out. And if I found that a founder wasn't doing that, I didn't want them in my program. In other words, if you were coming to WeWork Labs and you were going to take up a desk, you were going to sit there and be part of the program, then be part of the program. If not, then you're a customer of WeWork and you belong over there. And that's where I want you. I don't want you in here eating our food, taking up space, you know, just not being helpful. And so for me, that's the position I took for my program. And as a result, we had a community unlike anything else. I mean, it was a smaller community than, say, Seattle or down in the Bay Area, but they were a community of people who would all get together and go have drinks together. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. Because I, I, as I mentioned before, it's a lonely process to go through as a founder. And if you can lean on people and they become your friends and your ally, the proudest moment for me for WeWork Labs was we had a, we had a company to go through called Gabby. And they're for women's health. And we had two other founders who were not even part of our company. They were just like in the same cohort or in the same space as me. 10 o'clock at night, filling bags with tampons. These are two guys, two big burly guys, filling bags that had tampons in them because she had to get them out and ready for South by Southwest. That's amazing. That's the community I want to build. And they're all still friends today. We were has been gone, at least in Portland for a while. So when you find a program like that, that's so special, uh, it's, it's worth more than any balance sheet. So Josh, earlier I asked somebody, you know, do most average Americans realize how advanced tech is? So I want to ask you, do you think most average Americans realize what, how, how many great ideas are being worked on? How many entrepreneurs are trying to build greater stuff for everyone? No, and I and I and that's that's a hard question to answer because I don't think that people realize what amazing ideas are out there. Um, and I've watched a lot of really amazing companies die because people just didn't believe in it. Um, you know, like there's a company here in Portland called work from and Darren Buckner is one of, he's a good friend of mine. When I was a founder, we were sweet mates going through a program, uh, the Jaguar Land Rover ran here in Portland. Uh, his wife is now running, um, the founder gym. He's just an amazing human being. And I love him to death. He's, he, he's been working on the company for as long as I can just as long as I've been in Portland, which is nearly eight years. And because of COVID now, suddenly he's getting that growth that people should have seen before he's getting the, the attention and the investment because work from is a platform where you can work from anywhere. And so they almost started as like the Yelp for people that worked remote. Like you could see, how fast the internet was at a certain coffee shop or if it was quiet or if it allowed kids. And, um, and I think the, the change was they got into Techstars Anywhere, Ryan Cooter's uh, program down in San Diego. And that really changed things because I think it added a little level, level of val validity to his idea, excuse me. And then COVID hit and that really sent his business into a rocket ship, excuse me, a rocket ship because um, everybody's working remote now. 
And so that's, it's changing the way we work. But I mean, I've watched ideas like that um, die because investors didn't see how amazing this idea could be. And so I, I wish, and that's part of what my fund is solving is I wish more people would take earlier bets. I wish more investors would look at a company and be okay putting their money to work earlier. And in Portland, at least, or in Oregon in general, the issue has been that the fund managers that have been running funds that used to fund those pre-revenue companies or those companies that had a small, very small amount of revenue have all moved downstream. And so there's nobody, at least in Oregon, focusing solely on funding early stage pre-revenue startups. Nobody, there's nobody other than 1859 Ventures. We're the only ones in the state. There are angel groups, there are angel conferences, but there are no VCs out there focusing on this space. And as a result, what's happening is we're not filling the top of funnel for the later stages. And so these fund managers who used to be way here earlier are now needing to find deal flow outside of their area. Whereas if they focused in this region, because there's just no deal flow, they're you know, funding stuff down in the Bay Area or they're funding stuff in, in Washington or you know, in other parts of the country. And that's unfortunate. Um, I, I, wish, I wish more people would be just okay understanding that there are still really good ideas. And it doesn't mean that revenue is the driving factor of their success. It is one and it's probably mo the most important, but there are other variables out there that show that there's something there uh, in a business. So Josh, is that part of that was, I think it's called herd mentality. No one wants to be the first one in. So they're waiting for someone else to do it first. And, it, yeah. and this is a founders are, are suffering because no one wants to be the first one. And that's what we want to be. We want to be the first one. We want to be the one that validates a business enough so that other founders look at or other VCs look at it and go, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, to, uh, to make that bet. But to your point, yeah, it's just, uh, there's so much risk aversion. There's so much of that. I don't want to be the first one in that it hampers progress. It hampers growth. Um, and that's unfortunate. I really wish that uh, I, I, I wish I, I don't, I don't think we need to go backwards because I think we could talk philosophically about what happened with WeWork where the IPO didn't go through. And when everybody saw the S1, there was a lot of craziness in that S1, right? I read it and said the same thing. I was like, wow, this is just kind of nutty. Uh, it just didn't read like a typical S1. But that had a ripple effect all over the place because now founder or investors are doing a little bit more due diligence and looking behind the curtain a little bit more than they probably would have before that event happened. So I think the failed IPO from WeWork and other things like um, uh, the the medical, I can't remember her name. Oh man, why am I I know you're talking about. Um, yeah. I know, I know you're talking about, yeah. Theradyne or whatever it was. Yeah, there, yeah. And then... Uh, and then Quibi, same thing. Meg Whitman's latest they waste, that they, they put, waste, Quibi raised so much money. Wow, over a billion, and it failed, right? So I think more people, as as there are more examples of this, where a lot of big companies failed, because La Sports is another one. One point seven billion put in La Sports, and they failed. So as these failures happen, more investors are like, boy, I don't want to be the investor that's tied to these big failures. We need to be sure we're doing our homework and making sure that we're mitigating failure. And that's why when COVID hit, investment firms turned their attention to the portfolio companies instead of writing new checks. They wanted to make sure these companies got through and could weather the storm, or identified new revenue streams, identified different ways to do their business. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot of new checks written to founders, if you didn't have a relationship with a VC prior to COVID, like the chances of you raising dropped substantially. So Josh, so let's talk about your 1859 ventures. And first thing I want yeah. to talk, talk well, first thing I want to talk about is, I want you to cover this. I don't think enough people realize that you have to raise funds too, right? I think a lot of founders say, oh, let me call Josh. He has millions of dollars. I'll get money from him. 
I don't think a lot of founders entrepreneurs realize that these VC funds, they raise money too, right? And it's harder because as a founder, you can identify the different firms uh, based on what they've invested in the past. You can go LinkedIn and go see who they work, for, you know, like who works for which firm. Uh, you know, you can go to Crunchbase. You, it's easier to identify a firm uh, as a founder than it is to identify wealthy individuals who are willing to put money into your fund. And so if you, if as a founder, you have to talk to a hundred people to raise a hundred thousand uh, dollars, if you're going to raise a fund, tri triple that. Like it is an immense monumental task to raise a fund. And it has taken way longer than I thought. We announced the fund November of 2019, and we will likely close our first tranche this summer. Finally, I, we, we, it's listed on the angel list and, um, and you know, we're finally getting a, a critical mass of LPs signing up to be on that, uh, on that fund. But boy, it took a long time to get to this point. So, Jeff, are, do most funds, VC funds, raise money from private individuals, private equity firms, like pension funds? How does that work? It depends on the size. So, our fund is small. Um, it's five million, and I'm never going above five million. And the reason why I'm never going above five million is because that's the trap that a lot of other fund managers have got into. Is that, you know, you'll see it all the time. Fund one was ten million. Fund two was thirty million. Fund three is 40 million, fund five is 100 million. Well, then it becomes uh, a burden on the fund managers to write small checks. So to play devil's advocate, all of these, these fund managers have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So to write a $50,000 check or even a $100,000 check, the overhead, the cost to do that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the monetarily. economics don't work anymore, right? Don't work anymore. So if by keeping our fund at $5 million, I can maintain our place in the ecosystem. I can say, we're always going to write fifty dollars to $100,000 checks. We're not going to lead a round. We're going to be part, we, we might be first money in, but we'll never be the lead. We'll always be a follow-on, um, but we'll always be the first to commit. And um, if we stay true to that mission, then... Um, we can sustain this for the next 30 years and still maintain uh, and help to grow the early stage founders in the state. So Jeff, how does one become a VC? Is like some kind of certification test you got to take? You got to do some kind of stringent exam or you just say, I'm Josh Carter, I'm a VC. It depends. So for me, I'm not an accredited investor. So I have to um, take a little different approach. I went through AngelList to create a syndicate and, uh, and I, um, I, I take a management fee, but I don't participate in the carryover um, as the manager. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I'm not an accredited investor. So at some point I will, I'll take the carry because I'll be an accredited investor. So you don't have to be accredited. However, um, you do have to go through some steps to, uh, with the SEC to file to be, you know, to be able to manage these funds. And so what I loved about AngelList is they take care of a lot of that paperwork for you. So it's, you know, I say the proverbial we, but we, AngelList is the back office to the fund. I'm the only one raising money and cutting checks. That's it. 1859 is Josh and Angel, and AngelList. <laughs> That's it. So there's a proverbial we, I should say. So Josh, I know you want to be the first money in. Was a certain industry you're, you're focused on a certain sector or is this whoever can impress you? Yeah, it's not so much. Um, yeah, I'm not really focused on an industry. I mean, I've seen some really intriguing IOT companies. I've seen some really intriguing, um, even um, sportswear companies. I mean, in Portland, we're pretty lucky. We have Nike, we have Columbia, we have Keen, we have Adidas that all have their headquarters here. So we have a really interesting um like sportswear grouping here in the state that could really grow to be big, big companies. Um, but I've seen, like, for example, there's a good company out there called Little Sue. Little Sue is sort of like um, um, Blue Apron, but the difference being is you can buy it box by box or you can do the subscription. And the reason why they're so important is because they're kind of taking a different stance on the box meal. They're focused on 
uh, making it an educational piece rather than just saying, here's the ingredients, here's the sheet, here's the recipe, go make it. And what do you do at Blue Apron? You collect all those recipes and you go, I don't need it anymore because I can just go buy all this shit at the grocery store, probably cheaper, probably better, right? Their defensible position is that they're able to um, make it an educational piece. And so, you know, one month it was chocolate. And so you got this thing where you can melt chocolate. The next was pizza. So they gave you a, a grater. And then there's a whole booklet around, you know, helping your kids learn science, math, geography, and science. And so these little boxes, little Sue, and I'm not getting paid to promote them. I just think they're amazing. You get these boxes. I think they're like 30 bucks, 20 bucks. They come to your home just like this. And you get a little appliance and they're amazing. And their founder, Kelly Montoya, was really trying to raise around and had trouble raising around. And this is a remarkable company. They're profitable and they're growing in the age of COVID. She finally said, you know, screw it. I'm not going to raise any more money. I'm going to just close what I've raised. And now they're growing like a weed. It was a missed opportunity, right? And then we've had other companies that have had exits in, in our state where the funds in our state really didn't invest. So there's a lot of just really missed opportunities. I've talked to founders at the really early stages who said, you know, if I ever succeed, if I get into an IPO or if I get an exit, I'm not gonna put my money back in the state because nobody in the state helped me. That's a horrible, horrible way to think about how you're gonna grow a company in the state. We just don't have enough of that perpetual motion where founder goes, grows a company, has an exit, puts that money back in the ecosystem. That happens down in the Bay Area, it happens in Seattle, doesn't happen very much in Oregon. So how do you build that perpetual wheel? Well, you gotta fund them. You gotta fund them at the early stages so they come back and wanna give back to the community. If you're not building that perpetual engine, then you're a state that's not gonna grow. Like that's full stop, right? So Jeff, let's just take on this. Like you hear, you hear some VCs will say like, never call, call me, never call, email me. I need introductions. Someone has to know you or I even deal with you. Other, other VCs will say, well, no, I need deal flow. Call, call email, call, you know, email me. I'm not saying like, they'll say, I'm not saying I'm going to return your email, but I need to know what's out there. Right. So yeah. what, what, yeah, yeah. what's your take on that? And what do you, what do you I mean, it depends. Yeah. What I do personally is I will, I won't respond to every email but I will at least review every email. So if you've sent me an email about your business cold, I've looked at it. And if I didn't get back to you, there was no interest. Um, so I prefer a warm intro because at least I know my network, it doesn't want to blow up their validity or anything by introducing me to a bad founder. So if I get an introduction to somebody I trust and somebody I know, then, um, then I'm 100%, I take that meeting every single time. Um, so warm intros are certainly a better path to talk to me about that, um, versus just cold emailing me, but it certainly doesn't mean that I won't talk to you. It really depends on the business. And it's a funny choice too, like you, you see entrepreneurs that will say, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. You know, I sent this investor an email two days ago, I haven't replied back yet. What's going on. Right. Can you talk about the, the a huge number of emails you probably get every day that you have to go through. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a steady stream. I don't want to misrepresent that I'm getting flooded, but I, I get a pretty steady stream. Uh, look, I, I will say every founder makes the same mistake. I, you know, I'm going, I have, I'm part of a third program now called Washington Maritime Blue, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we just covered this in bootstrapping versus fundraising. We did a session on Thursday. And in there, I talked about a story where when we were building Brightwork, Brightwork used to be, its first iteration was um, an analytics platform. We were building an API of APIs. So basically if you were Lytics or Google Analytics or any of these other APIs that handled analytics for a platform, we wanted to be that middle person that funneled all that data in. And then we would take where there would be gaps and fill those gaps. That was the first iteration of Brightwork and ended up being completely different. But that was the first iteration. And I remember being down in Venice, California and calling Bubba from DFJ. Yes, his name is really Bubba. But I remember calling Bubba from DFJ and we had a call with Bubba 
and I pitched um, Brightwork and it was horrible. It went really, really, really bad. And DFJ is like top tier uh, Sand Hill Road investment firm. And I pitched before we should have pitched to that firm. And every founder, like I said, every founder does this. They think that they have this great idea. I'm going to call DFJ or Sequoia or Bessemer or any of these funds that are managing a billion dollars. And I'm going to get money from these big investment firms. What they fail to do and what I failed to do, because I made this mistake, is I failed to go through and do my homework. Who, what, what do they invest in? And at what stage? What's their average check size? Um, do I know anybody in my network who is invested in this, uh, who, where they've gotten investment from this firm? If a founder just did some simple homework and invested in the time to understand what, what firms invest in what, and at what stage, and at how much, they'd find themselves in a much better position to raise money than they would if they just said, wouldn't it be great if I got funding from Sequoia and we put it up on TechCrunch and that's gonna make my, my business grow really rapidly. <laughs> no, that's the wrong way to go. It's stupid. It's never gonna work. It's the only time that ever works is if you're a founder that has an exit, a profound exit, and you have a track record, then yeah, you call up Sequoia, say, this is my next thing, and they cut you a check. But if you're a first time founder, you don't have a track record, you're starting at the earliest stages, you're gonna raise a friends and family round, you're gonna go for the pre-seed uh, investment firms, maybe you're gonna raise from a number of angels, but you're certainly not gonna call the top tier companies that, are, that have billions of dollars under management. So Josh, next question. How often should a founder follow up? Like, suppose a founder is trying to get in touch with an, invest, with an investment from a VC or angel, or even trying to close a cousin, right? Is there a time when, like, you follow up too many times? No, your objective is to get closure. So you want one of three answers, right? You want yes, no, or fuck off. <laughs> but whatever you, <laughs> you as a founder, you want that closure. So that's what you want. And you're gonna keep pestering them until you get that answer, that response, that closure. That's the same for investors. You gotta keep pestering them until you get closure. And the faster you get to that, even if it's a no, the easier it is for you to move on. So I see so many founders that <clears throat> they'll come back and they'll say, well, I emailed that guy three times. I never heard back. Okay, well, did they respond? No. So why did you quit? We all get busy. We all get, you know, uh, hammered with emails. They want to tell you yes or no. And until you get that, stop, continue to pester them. Just keep, keep driving until you get one of those three responses. And it's okay. It's okay to, you know, get to that point where they're like, I, uh, I'm just tired of hearing from you. Please leave me alone. It's not okay to send two emails and give up because at the, at the end of the day, they want to see how tenacious you are, how resourceful you are. How are you going to get my attention in the most creative way possible? And, um, and so I, I saw one founder, they uh, sent, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but um, even today, the, um, the, <clears throat> the SEC will send you your physical print copy of your stock. So when you file with the SEC as a new business, you get awarded a piece of paper that's a stock of your company that says how many shares you have. I've seen founders award stock, even if it's just one stock to an investor and then mail that stock to the investor as a thank you for taking a meeting or just like to get their attention. And it's just one stock, like what is, what's it worth, like a penny? But it's like, it's creative. It's, it's enough to like go out and go, wow, this is, unique. This is interesting. Or they find them at an event that they're speaking at, or, you know, like there's just so many hacks to, fi <clears throat> excuse me, to figure out how to get the attention of a VC. Sorry, I had to take water. <clears throat> so Josh, I mean, obviously the advice would be if you're, you're, you're trying to fundraise, don't like try to reach out to 10,000 investors, right? What's a good amount of numbers for, for founders you think they should focus on to try to raise funds from 10, 25? It depends on how much you're raising 
and uh, how much, you know, uh, what your stage is. And I think a good metric is for every hundred conversations you have, that's a hundred thousand dollars. And it's really, you have to treat um, fundraising like you do sales. It's a numbers thing. I, what's my top line number? If I have 100 emails or 100 numbers and I send out a hundred emails, I get 20 responses. And out of those 20 responses, I get uh, 10 first meetings. And out of those 10 first meetings, I got one check. Well, now you have the baseline equation by which you can start twisting the knobs and pushing the buttons. If I want two people to fund me, well, now I have to reach out to 200 people. So now you start to see, just like you would your sales funnel, what that metric is that pushes to a yes and what that top line number needs to be in order for you to get to the goal that you need to get. And if you're focused on that and if you're obsessed about those numbers, it's going to be easier for you to get to your goal. And I will say, one of the common misconceptions or common mistakes, I should say, that founders make is that they go through this endeavor and they're not ready when they have that discussion. So they're not ready to sit down with a founder and say, this is why I need your money and this is why we're a safe bet. And so a lot of founders, what they need to understand is there are really only three things that uh, are two things that an investor is looking for. They're looking for control and uh, how much ownership of that company they can take, right? And so, um, so that's what they're looking for. What I look for as an investor is, um, do they understand the business really, really well? Have they built a financial model? Have they built a financial model that, in which they understand uh, their entire business? And why I say a financial model is so, so important is because um, it is really the health, health metric or a, the, the overall health of the business. And so for those that have never built a financial model, but they're building a tech business, I would stop what you're doing right now and do it. Do it right now. Because what you'll do is the first tab of that financial model is all your assumptions. And then the rest of the sheets, the different tabs are all of your different things, your hiring strategy, your P&L, your sales economics, your unit economics. And when you change, if you've done it right, when you change something in your assumption tab, you can see what it does to your bottom line. And you can see exactly what it does if you were to raise 500,000, what does that do to grow your business? Uh, so you'll be able to see that with the financial model and, and it's really, really important. And so um, if I, if I talk to a founder and they haven't built their financial model, that's their homework, go build your financial model and come talk to me. Cause if you haven't done it, then you, you really don't know what your business looks like. I don't know if I'm beating that in enough, <laughs> but financial models, very, 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 very important. So just back to like, you know, the hundreds of phone conversations. And that's the main reason why, you know, people say fundraising is a time sucker, right? Cause you know, hopefully you're just not calling someone, hopefully you've done the research you've done, you know, I mean, hopefully you like, you like, you, you, if you're like a B2B, hopefully you're not reaching out to consumer investors. You know, if you're trying to raise a C ground, you're not reaching out to C series investors. Hopefully you're at least doing that. Right. But just, yeah, this is a time sucker. Right. And then like yeah. you fundraise, you build a business, you can't do it all. Correct. Right. I mean, like I said before, I, I think there is, I, if I were to do it again, I would bootstrap. And, and the only reason to take any venture capital money is when you are ready to accelerate your business to a point where, you know, you're just ready to, to fuel the jet in, of growth. Before that, it doesn't make any sense to take any investment. There are so many non-dilutive options out there for founders that are working on companies. There are SBIR money out there. There's STTR money with universities. They're non-dilutive grants, endowments, foundations. Um, do your research. I love talking to founders who've taken SBIR money because it means that that's, they haven't diluted their ownership. They've found ways to fuel their operations and they're putting that money to work. 
when they get to me, by the time they get to me, I want them to say, this is where this money is going to take me from a revenue perspective. And that kind of goes back to the financial model. They understand where that's going to take. So many founders put in their deck. Uh, if I if I raise 500,000, I'm going to hire a salesperson. I'm going to hire five more engineers. I'm going to put it into marketing. The investors already know that. That's implied. They know you're going to do that. What they want to know is where's that going to take you revenue, revenue wise? So a better way to position that is say, I'm going to raise 500,000 and that's going to get us to a million and a half a year in revenue. Boy, that's a far more compelling story to tell than I'm going to raise 500,000 and hire all these people and spend all this money. We know you're going to spend the money. It needs to make you money, right? And so from a VC perspective, as a fund manager, my objective, if I raise $10 million, how do I get that money back and then some as fast as humanly possible? That's what my LPs want. They don't want their money back in eight years. If they can get it back in three, that's far more profound. So it's funny. We just had this talk, uh, like I said, at, at Maritime Blue with our founders. And I run a, a program with a gentleman named Nate Tolbert. He runs our Tacoma program. And, uh, and he said, look, as a VC, I don't care about you. you. We may be friends and we may be friendly, but I don't care. All I care about is your business is going to put a return into my LPs because I want them to keep funding all of my funds. So your business better make me a ton of money or I don't, don't call me. Can you imagine that? Like as a VC uh, and as a founder hearing that, but it's true, right? If, if you fail as a founder and you've taken VC money from somebody, you think they're going to be on your Christmas card list? You think you're going to be on their Christmas card list? No, they're not going to call you. And that's part of the frustration and kind of goes back to the mental health of founders. Like when you are on a business that's on a rocket ship, boy, your calls and you're the best buds with everybody. As soon as that business fails, all of that stops. So in those earlier stages, like just know, be obsessed with the numbers, be obsessed with revenue, start collecting money, Co collect revenue from day one, get in the habit of collecting money from day one. Uh, even at those earlier stages where you're like, well, I want people to try my stuff out. Cool. Charge them. Um, don't, don't, uh, you got to set a culture for revenue from day yeah. one. Talk about this. When should I found a switch from focus on MVP particle market fit to going all out on scaling? Uh, that's a great question. I am a firm believer that there is no such thing as an MVP, that there's only the platform that you put in the hands of a customer. And there's always, uh, John from RunScope, who I worked with at Twilio, had a great piece of advice for us because we tried to put the platform, we tried to put a platform out that was going to be perfect, like had all these bells and whistles. What we hadn't done yet is talk to customers. We hadn't talked to the people that were going to use this platform, but even assume, and we were just assuming they were going to like all the features that we put out. And so I think from a founder perspective, find ways to get somebody to fund the, the first iteration of your platform. And there's a great, um, John said something that I'll never forget. He said, if you are not embarrassed by your first product, you're doing it wrong. It, when we released Brightwork, it was just a command line interface. There was no user interface at all. There was no pretty little buttons you could push. You opened up your terminal window and you, you SSH'd into your machine and you pushed all of your code out into the cloud. That was it. That's what we pushed out. And we got 500 people to sign up the first day. So get the platform out into the hands of people and get them to pay you for it. Because what they will end up be uh, doing is being a great focus group for you to iterate on the platform. When RunScope first came out, they were just an API platform where you can build an API, uh, and, but they didn't have a way for you to test it. So once you build this beautiful API, you had no way to stress test it. So RunScope created this like stress test for you to stress test the API you just built. And it ended up being 60% of their revenue. But they did that only after they started talking to their, their customers who were all saying, this is amazing. And I built this on your platform, but how do I test that it works? And so they built this thing that you can stress test your API and, and they ended up selling to computer associates for a truckload of money. And it was because they built this platform that, you know, could really help their customers. Josh, you, you mentor a lot of people. 
how, how can you tell if the founder is open to being mentored? Like, how, how do you tell that? Yeah, that, that you can find that pretty easily. I've run into a lot of founders who go into it and say, well, I know, I know, I know. And they, they're like a teenage kid. They know everything. So um, you, can, you can figure out pretty quickly when a founder is coachable or not. And I don't waste my time on people that don't want to be coached. That, that assume they know everything. And then look, I don't know everything either. And what I tell founders all the time is I'm just one data point. Go collect data, be obsessed with the data. And that includes mentors, uh, investors, customers, be obsessed with the numbers. Numbers don't lie. And so you can get all the great feedback you can get from mentors and myself, but at the end of the day, it has to make sense for your business. And founders who listen to that and ingest that and go out and uh, make those changes based on numbers and not emotion. Those are the founders I want to work at, work for, and work with. Um, I, I don't want to work with a founder who, um, just because they have an impressive background, they think that's what's going to carry them into, you know, you know, being able to raise a round or getting a lot of customers. I've watched a lot of really good companies that have lots of really amazing products fail because their founders were arrogant and assumed they knew a lot. Just, just talk about your current role. I, I believe yeah. it's the Washington Maritime Ally Innovation Accelerator. Washington Maritime Blue Innovation Accelerator. It's a mouthful. Uh, yeah, it's part of uh, Washington Maritime Blue, which is a nonprofit uh, tied to the state of Washington. And it's part of Governor Inslee's initiative to grow the maritime industry in the state of Washington. Um, through a number of different initiatives. Mine is an accelerator program. It's a four month accelerator. We take uh, 10 companies per year. This year we took 11 um, and we run them through a very similar program where it's mentorship driven. Um, just like we were collabs, I make sure the program isn't a hindrance for their ability to grow the business. And, um, and because it's all virtual, we do a lot of things to sort of force them all to kind of congeal and, and collaborate uh, through Slack and through a bunch of different other things that we do. But the program itself um, is just remarkable. I, I, it's fascinating because I have three founders right now that I think they're gonna announce their funding round very, very soon. And I've never had that in a program before. I've never seen such growth uh, in, a, in founders so quickly and they are sponges. They just want to learn. They just want to do whatever it is that we put in front of them. We just did financial modeling on Tuesday. So for three days, they spent, uh, you know, building their financial model. So uh, it's a cool program. My role is to grow this hub and spoke model for the maritime industry uh, in the innovation space. So while the Seattle program, my program is the hub of that, and we're going to build an actual physical location in Ballard, um, it really is just part of a, a small part of the overall ecosystem we're building. So I mentioned we have a, a program with the Port of Tacoma. That's our incubator. And so our incubator is a one-year program. It's less educational based and more like getting our hands dirty to help those founders grow from ideation to scale. Um, <clears throat> we work a lot with um, the Navy, so TechBridge Northwest and, uh, and Alvar and Bremerton. We're, we're working on collaborative stuff there. And then I also sit on the board for Oregon Rain, which is the regional acceleration, regional accelerator innovation network uh, here in the state of Oregon, which where I live, and um, and we're doing a collaborative stuff with the Hatfield Science Center in Newport, uh, and we just hired our first blue venture catalyst there. So for me, I want to build a regional network of maritime innovators uh, because you know it's interesting uh, being a Navy vet, kind of coming full circle and working with the DOD and connecting innovators with the, the military. Um, it's a, it's a really fun, fun initiative. And so this year, you're the first cohort, so to speak, right? This is the second one. Second one. Coincidentally, the first one was a partnership between labs and Maritime Blue. And so, excuse me, you mentioned Elizabeth Scallon. Uh, she uh, created that partnership between Maritime Blue and WeWork Labs. And, um, we ran that program uh, last year through WeWork Labs in Seattle. 
And then I, I actually came up to Seattle and proxied a few of the programming elements. And when I became a free agent, uh, Elizabeth uh, called me up and said, hey, would you be interested in running this program? We're, we're not gonna run it through WeWork anymore. And I couldn't jump fast enough. I love Elizabeth. I think she's amazing. Um, and I really enjoyed working with her. And so the opportunity to be able to work with Elizabeth again, I, I couldn't jump fast enough. So how do, how do companies find out about this program? Is it like just word of mouth or like, how does that, how do you, how do you find your people for this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we leverage a lot of our ecosystem partners to do that. The Port of Seattle is a great um, partner with us. Uh, and, and we do a lot of work and they fund a lot of our work. The Commerce Department in Washington, they fund a lot of our work. Um, so we, we leverage our ecosystem partners. There are a lot of, surprisingly, I didn't, I didn't know this before I started, there are a lot of maritime innovation programs around the world. And I'm talking Boston, Iceland, the Netherlands, Japan, China, and we, uh, Maritime Blue is a part of that global ecosystem. So when we, when we open our uh, applications for the program, they get the word out pretty broadly. Um, and then of course we use things like F6S to help, uh, help us um, recruit more as well. But I think, you know, the program was always meant to be an on-prem program. The first year we did it, everybody was at WeWork Labs in Seattle. Um, and then this year, because of COVID, we were like, well, let's, we'll make it virtual, but we'll also widen the aperture of where we get founders from, because we really want people to understand what Maritime Blue is and how, how impactful this program is. We, we had Pure Watercraft in our last program. They just raised a $35 million A round. And so we're getting these outcomes already of companies that have come through our program um, Silverback Marine is part of our current cohort and they're doing great. Their sales are really, uh, you know, growing really rapidly. Uh, we have Allisense and, and they're doing really well. So we have some really cool companies uh, going through the program and using our network and leveraging sort of the ability to reach a global group has been really helpful this year. And then as we get into more programs, we'll go back to being an on-prem uh, program. So obviously you focus on maritime. Is there a certain sector of maritime you focus on? Like, you know, I don't know. I'm making this up because I don't know, like yachts or improving engine speed or just as, as, as long as they're like maritime related, they can apply. Yeah, that's, that's a good question too. The, uh, the first year we just kind of sort of, it was an experiment. And we even took a seafood company last year. And I think this year we were a bit more thoughtful about it. We do have an aluminum boat builder. We have a marine construction company. But for the most part, primarily they're tech companies. And so they can be shipping and logistics. There's one that's handling credential services for mariners because that's just, it's still a paper process, which is ridiculous. Um, we have uh, folks dealing in like shipping where if you have an empty container going from San Diego to San Francisco, that's gonna cost you money to, to move that empty container. What if you had somebody that just happened to need something shipped from San Diego to San Francisco, well, we can they can connect you with somebody to fill that container. So you're making money and not shipping something that's empty. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think we, what we focused on this time was instead of the vertical, let's focus on the stage in which these companies are at. So the companies that we have this year are really sort of like getting ready to raise their seed round all the way to I'm getting ready to possibly raise an A round. So because we're able to keep that confined to stages, not just verticals, we're able to provide a program that's far more relevant. I can put you know, a whole panel of investors to talk about how to raise a seed round and it's not gonna alienate a company that's already done that. Or I can put financial modeling, for example, because most of them haven't done it yet. And nine out of the 11 will be there because they need to know how to build a financial model. So if I focused on the stage and not necessarily the vertical, then the programming itself has more teeth. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Yeah. So do y'all um, give funding or take any equity in the company? No, um, the program uh, doesn't provide any equity and we don't, or any funding and we don't take any equity. Um, 
we are working on possibly raising a fund so that as we get into more uh, companies, uh, more cohorts, there there is fine, uh, funding available um, because I feel like that's one of the main missing pieces of of a program like this. Like if we can put some skin in the game, then I think <clears throat> it'll uh, it'll really help jumpstart these startups in a big way. And again, it'll be something that we talked about earlier, where if we're the first money into these companies uh, within Seattle, we can really take advantage of all these other uh, relationships we're building. And hopefully they come in with us and, and help fund these companies as well. Um, so we want to use it as almost like a mar market signal, but also, you know, we want to, we want to put our money where our mouth is. So, so I know you're virtual now. I just want to ask, are any of these companies from like, or what I'll say, like non-water, any companies like of Kansas, Nebraska, like where there's no water at all? Or is that pretty <laughs> much from like loaded could be other water pretty much? Yeah. So, uh, we have one from San Antonio. Mm -hmm. We have a company that's in Houston. We have a company in DC, one in Toronto, um, and one on the East Coast. I can't remember where he's from, but uh, for the most part, five out of the 11 are from Washington State. We have a mobility company, Pacific Mobilities, in our cohorts, um, and they're electrifying shipping, um, you know, commercial sh um, commercial delivery vans, and that has a direct correlation between the port, right? The port has a really good focus on trying to do carbon offset, and part of that is the vehicles that come into the port to grab things that get delivered out, um, you know, need to be carbon offset as well, and so. Pacific Mobility are working to electrify the commercial mobile fleet. Josh, can you talk quickly about the process, application process for companies? Yeah, it's a competitive process like all the other ones. Um, we take uh, a number of applications through a date, and then there's a screening committee that goes through and scores the startups. And based on the scores, the top, say, I think we did this this year, we took the top 32 companies. And, uh, and then there's like a final selection committee that goes through. And um, if there's last interviews, we'll do that. We'll, if we have any follow-up questions with the founders, we'll, we'll do like a last interview. But as long as their application is pretty comprehensive, we can almost make a decision just based on their application. And so we spend a lot of time reviewing the companies, reviewing their video that they, that they submit, and, uh, and just trying to figure out, you know, is this a, a company that can... Uh, understand how to build a better company. Is this a company that has potential to grow the local economy? Uh, does it have potential to create jobs in the state? Because at the end of the day, that's really what we want to do with this program is it doesn't matter where they're at. You know, we have a technology company based out of Toronto, but if the Port of Seattle buys into it and it's able to create a few more jobs, then that's a success metric for us. If they have an exit, and uh, and it somehow benefits Washington. That's a benefit. That's an, uh, that's a that's a great metric. And so uh, so that's what we focus on. Is at the end of the day, we really want this program to be known as one of the top maritime programs in the country, <clears throat> and we want it to have real impact on the state of Washington and the region in general for creating collaborative innovation that creates meaningful, long lasting rewarding jobs. So Josh, you, you've, you've been at a um, WeWork Labs, Patriot Bootcamp, Operation Code, your current job. How do you keep on getting these great positions, right? What, what, what are you doing? What are you doing that, that all those people are not doing? Yeah, that's funny. That's luck, man. I've been so fortunate to be able to build a tremendous network of people who I've had such a great time working with that if I end up moving to another company, it's only because you know, I've been able to make really good connections with people. It's not deliberate. I, I guarantee you, you asked me five years ago, there's no way I would have said I was going to run a maritime accelerator and start a VC fund. That wasn't in the cards. and certainly wasn't something that I would have ever guessed I'd be doing. Um, but there's certainly a, a very clear line of, of how I got to where I'm at. Uh, but I will say, um, Growing a network has been key. Um, having people to talk to and connect with and give back to um, has been really, really, really key to my ability to kind of move about in my career. And um, 
And, and for those like who are wondering how to do that, um, it's being authentic, right? It's not taking more than you give. Um, I think if you avail yourself to people and make it authentic without ever really wanting anything in return, people gravitate towards those people. They want to be around those people because they know they're going to get such a rewarding outcome out of that relationship. And those are the people I've always gravitated towards. I still talk to my former commanding officer from my last boat. In fact, I think the last time I flew out to DC, he took me on a tour of all the things around the Washington Mall. I mean, I was 19 when I was in, on his boat and he was our captain. He works at the Pentagon now and I'm in my 40s. So, I mean, I remember holding his kid when he was doing, he was, we were doing change of command and his kid was a little baby. That kid is now in college. So it's just, um, you never know um, how a relationship will blossom. Um, it's just about being authentic and being there and, and uh, answering the phone when they call and if they need help, help them. Um, if you come at it from a perspective of how do you build a community, not just locally, but how do you build your own community? Um, it's gonna have a, a great impact on your life and your career. Yeah, Josh, I think so many, entrepreneurs, not, not just entrepreneurs, just people in general, don't realize the power of building a network and building a brand, right? So many people just work nine to five, go home and, you know, I, I, yeah, I think a lot of people are missing that, like you said. It's, um, it's, it is the single thing that I think has led to um, my success is just that, that ability to call somebody and be like, hey, so I'm a free agent, I'm looking for this. And then somebody's on it right away. Um, you know, I even I went through the Defense Innovation Accelerator uh, last year and I was on a great team and I ended up leaving because I got this job and, and uh, but I still talk to them and I still help them out. And I made a lot of really good connections uh, for the Innovation Lab at the Navy and Mike Dodd. And um, I still reach out to him because I have founders that need his help. So um, you never know who these little connections end up being and how impactful they'll be. It's a small world and you run into so many people so often um, that uh, it, it's just, it's a really cool outcome when you can make this connection to this person and some magic happens. Coffee with co-founders started and we had like 10 people come the first time, but throughout its existence, we've had companies created out of there. People have found their co-founders out of that event. And so if you're ever looking for things uh, that meet a need for you and it doesn't exist, just create it, start it. So Josh, in the past, you, you've been, let's say, critical of the Portland startup scene. Can you tell us why you've been so critical and has it gotten better in your opinion? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm critical because that I, I, I come from it from the perspective of the founder. And to be fair, it's not just Portland. I think it's Oregon overall. And we talked a little about this risk aversion that happens. And I think for, for Oregon in general, there's this underlying tension that exists in that people, um, people want to see innovation happen in the state of Oregon. They really want to see startups grow here. But to a point, in other words, I don't ever see the Amazon spheres being built in park blocks. I don't see the round Apple building being built in the suburbs here. Um, Nike's the biggest thing out here. Intel's the biggest thing out, out here. Um, but I don't see it. I don't see any company like coming in and building to that grand scale. It just doesn't happen anymore. And so because of that, there's this underlying tension that is basically great. We want to help you grow. But if you get to a certain size, piss off. We don't want that here, right? And so that's the frustration. I, you know, I grew up down in the Bay Area and that was really never even a, a thought. People just knew that innovation happened there and that Silicon Valley was a thing and that growth was a thing. And that's what drove innovation in that ecosystem. And that was why people enjoyed such healthy salaries. But there's a downside to that as well is that, you know, there's gentrification of old neighborhoods. So there is definitely a downside to that. And I think Portland and Oregon in general 
are watching that, watching what happens down in the Bay Area. And they don't want that here. They don't want that to happen here. They like their work-life balance. Boy, if you can find somebody in Oregon that works more than 40 hours a week, that person probably didn't grow up here, right? <laughs> and it's funny because like I see restaurants, if they close at eight o'clock, they probably aren't from, you know, they're probably from outside the state because restaurants down where I'm from, they stay open until 10 o'clock. Um, so it's just, a, it's, it's where you grew up. It's the lifestyle you grew up with. It's how you were raised in that ecosystem and their tolerance for what they perceive to be bad growth. And um, I think it's getting better. I hope it's getting better. Um, we'll see. But I just don't, we don't have historical data that shows big exits for Oregon. So they've been able to sort of keep that level of growth at a sustained pace where living here is still affordable, buying a house is still affordable, um, and the work-life balance is still something that exists here. I think you can have both. I think there's a way to grow a company and grow an ecosystem and not have the bad parts of like gentrification in a neighborhood. Um, there's a way to do it. And I think it, it's, um, and you have to do it from a position of, of equality and being equitable about it, including everybody in the conversation. If you leave out somebody, then it, it's not gonna work. And I think that's what happened in the Bay Area. They didn't include everybody. Uh, it's still, you know, the Bay Area is the most diverse place in the country. But you go down and you see all the tech companies and how many CEOs are a different color other than white. That's the issue, right? At the at the crux of it. You include more people in it. You have people like if if CEOs look like a Benetton ad, like it'd be far more, there'd be less discussion about the underlying tension. It has to be equitable, it has to include everybody. Everybody has to have a seat at the table or the growth doesn't work. Yeah, I remember I was on, I think it was on Twitter, I seen it where somebody did a data study of like the, all the CEOs and it, it was crazy. Like he broke it down like 23% were white men named Mark, 22% were white men named Mike, 22% were white men named Larry, you know. Not only they're all white, they all had the like, same name, which is even another level of craziness. Yeah, it's frustrating. It is really frustrating. And it's hard too, because if you're a founder of a company that had some sort of success and now suddenly you want to make diversity a uh, focus um, how can you do it authentically? And I think Twilio struggled with this too. Uh, let's, I mean, even Twilio, they're doing it better than other companies, but in the early days, it was definitely a struggle. Jeff, so, you know, the things out there, you know, if you're a startup founder, don't quit, keep grinding, keep on going, you know, be tenet, be, have tenacity, you know, grit, all that kind of stuff. Is there a time when a founder should say, you know what, man, this isn't working out for me. I need to not even pivot, but like this stop altogether and, and do something different. It's hard to recognize that because you have put so much effort into it and so much time and energy and money. I think there, if you're following the data, if you're following the numbers, then it's pretty easy to figure out what's working and what's not working. And if you're focused on the metrics, then you can identify it really easily. I think part of that also is finding mentors that have gone through and have failed or who could be intellectually honest. When we went through Techstars, um, we went through with a gentleman named Troy Hennikoff. Troy Hennikoff created Sure Payroll and then sold it off to Paychex. He used to walk around with a shirt that said, we'll tell you your baby's ugly. And I think you need to have that type of person that's willing to be open and honest and tell you your idea is stupid. And if you don't have that and you're, you're surrounding yourself with people that think your idea is amazing, then that should be a red flag for you as a founder. You need to find somebody that calls you out on your bullshit. A company is not emotional. It, there's no emotion to it. It's really just, it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism of capitalism. And capitalism isn't emotional. So you have to find people that will allow you to um, be vulnerable. You have to allow yourself to be vulnerable and you have to have people out there that'll tell you the unfiltered truth about your business. 
And if you as a founder are not willing to accept that openness and that harsh reality, that harsh truth, then being a founder may not be the thing that you're supposed to be doing. You have to be able to separate personal with business. That, I mean, that's just a fundamental thing. And too many times I see founders um, that are just, that get really upset when somebody says, this is a bad idea. You should focus on this or you should pivot to this or you should look at this or maybe this isn't the right thing. Like, you know, we talked earlier about, I had a woman across the, from me who talked about gardening as a service. And in my head, I'm going, that is so silly. Why would you do something like that? Why don't you just say you're a gardener? Say open a landscaping business. Why does it have to be like garden as a service? It doesn't have to be a bu buzzword to be what it is. And, um, and so it was just, you just have to be able to say that and hear that and understand it and know that it's coming from a place of, of positivity. Josh, I understand you have some, something for our listeners today. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I love to give back, you know, I talked a lot about that earlier and I would love to sit down with any listener who is thinking about, you know, starting a business has a business that needs some, you know, to tell you your baby is ugly. I'm happy, <laughs> happy to spend some time and, uh, and talk to your listeners about their idea. So uh, for anybody that wants to chat with me, my email is just josh at 1859.vc. That's 1859.vc. They can email me. I'll give them my calendar uh, link so that they can book some time at their convenience. And we'll sit, let's sit down and figure out if what you're working on makes sense. It doesn't have defensible, uh, you know, defensible, you know, things that make it a viable business. I'm happy to help. So Josh, what kind of interval talk? Can you give us advice and wisdom or anything else you want to talk about? You know, I, I tell this a lot um, to founders, you know, your business is a hypothesis until someone gives it, gives you money, then it's a business. So if you treat your business like a science experiment, write down your hypothesis, collect data, be obsessed with collecting data, like put numbers on paper, numbers won't lie. If you do all that, you're gonna set yourself up for success. If you ignore the data, if you're, on, if you're not authentic about it, or if you compromise that in any way, then you're gonna be in a path for failure. The other thing I will say is surround yourself and your team, uh, surround them with people that understand what they're getting into uh, as it relates to startups. Startups are hard. They take up a lot of your time. They are all your focus. But the other thing is that a lot of founders don't realize is that your family and friends go through it as well. So if you're gonna do startups and you have a family Make sure they're included in the process. Make sure they understand what they're getting themselves into. Make sure they understand that, um, you know, there are, there, there are going to be times where you're not available. And, um, and they have to be okay with that. When I, we got into Techstars, um, my wife and I have been, been together for a long time. When I got into Techstars, it, it, she knew it was only three months. Uh, she kind of jokingly went, that's all? That's, it's just three months? But my, for my co-founder, you know, he'd only been married five years. So it was a, it was a huge lift for them to be without their dad for three months in Chicago while he went through this program. But you have to include everyone. You have to include everyone or it's not, it's not going to work. And um, team is critical. People are critical. Josh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Hey, anytime, Jason. Thanks for having me, man. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.